from the stars like no other can. Bailey builds guitars with the wind and the sun. Hi folks, welcome back to the workshop for the guitar making channel. Um, I'm Mark Bailey and I build guitars and I teach other people how to build guitars. So if that floats your boat, if you're interested in that kind of thing, then make sure you subscribe and like and share. Um, if you find something interesting in this video, make sure you do all that YouTube stuff because it really helps us out. Today we're going to be talking about side bending. In fact, I'm going to show you a few different methods, um, doing it by hand, and then um, I'm going to show you around my um, side bending machine. <whistles> Sweet woo. So this is um, a side bending machine. I'm also going to show you um, briefly how you would do it by hand. And um, <clears throat> the main reason I'm doing this is because we had had a message on my forum so we've got a, a free forum if you want to join up if you're having any issues with your guitar build then you can um, uh, then you can get on the forum for free join up for free and there are full-on guitar making courses on there so if you want to um, build your own guitar and you want the step-by-step full-on guidance then um, there's uh, Huge, huge amount of work went into these courses, build your own electric and build your own acoustic, where we start with a blank piece of paper and you go through the whole process step by step until you've got your finished instrument. Um, if you've watched a previous live stream, you'll see um, the results of um, Jeff and Andrew, who are father and son building. Um, so, yeah, a lot of people wondered whether it was actually possible, including myself, to do this over the internet but it turns out it's not only possible but some of my students have gone on to build um, incredible spectacular guitars I'm sure we'll do a special video on that at some point um, but I got a, a message on my forum just the other day uh, I wish that this guy had got to me before he'd splashed out um, so the reason I'm making this video is to try and stop you um, making the kind of mistake that this guy made and um, apologies um, for using you as an example. I won't read your name out or anything, but um, yeah, I wanted to use it as, as an example of the kind of thing that can go wrong. When you're getting into this game, you can end up wasting money and, um, you know, in the worst case, it can even be dangerous. So I got this email. I'll read it out to you. In fact, you can go to the forum and read this yourself and you can read our responses. So, um, I responded and also thanks Darren for your response as well that's uh, as always top quality answers um, that's what I like about the forum is it's not just me pontificating um, others get a chance to pontificate too 
So it's all good fun. And we're all friendly bunch, so you know, there's no one-upmanship or anything like that. So he's, it goes, um, I'm new to the full build game and have spent the last month or so kitting my little workshop studio out with some basic tools, making jigs and prepping my timber for the build. Bought a silicon heating blanket from China somewhere. It arrived, looked okay, and today I attempted doing my first side. I've bent sides before, but with a steam box on a repair project and a separate botched build about 10 years ago. Yeah, I never had much luck with steam boxes either, but that's another video. Um, I had the side thickness between 2 to 2.2 mil on my depth gauge drill jig so that's good thickness was good i assumed the heat blanket controller would actually control the temperature and looks identical to others i've seen on youtube however i don't have an accurate thermometer and ended up using a meat thermometer that was my first clue as to something amiss um, and he, he in brackets himself he says he would not recommend that anyhow he goes on the bending seemed to be going okay until I heard a cracking at around 90% of the center clamping, so that would be the waste area. And what I assumed to be steam, but turned out to be smoke. I turned the dial down low and carried on until I had the top and bottom clamped in my jig and turned it off as soon as they were. After about 12 hours, I went back and opened it up turns out that the heat was far too high and and had charred the waste quite badly as well as there being a large crack between the bottom and top bout on top of this the pink orange rubbery stuff on the blanket had puckered up and now has the consistency of two hour old chewing gum my first question is this can i still use the blanket or is that a costly write-off? And secondly, does it matter if my replacement sides are from a new set of mahogany of the same grade? I've already joined the back pretty seamlessly and started on the back strutting, so I don't want to chuck this. Any help would be much appreciated. Well, brilliant, thanks for your comment and I'm really sorry that you didn't get to us um, before your little minor disaster. So I'll answer the second question first. Um, does it matter if my replacement sides are from a new set of mahogany? So it doesn't really matter. Um, they may not match exactly, but um, I doubt if anybody's going to notice. If they look fairly similar, I don't think it's going to be a problem. Um, if they really do look different, then you could always consider doing a tobacco burst or a stain to make them look very similar. So it doesn't matter. You can replace the sides with another set and just keep going. And you don't have to chuck the back away and start all over again. So yeah, it's heart. My heart goes out to you. It's uh, soul destroying when this kind of thing happens, especially when you've splashed out for the cash for what you think is, um, you know, the, the ultimate gear. Um, so it probably comes from watching a, a YouTube video or something where you've seen a guy using a silicon heat blanket, um, but he hasn't given you all of the information. So that's what I'm going to do today. So I'm going to take you on a little tour of the side bender. And um, I think that you had um, one piece of your kit missing. So I'll show you the different pieces of the kit. In fact, you had two pieces missing. Um, so um, here we have what I call the Fox side bender. So it's actually um, from Blue Creek Guitars. It's got Blue Creek Guitars written on it somewhere. But if you Google Fox Sidebender or Blue Creek Sidebender, then you'll find, um, you can buy the plans or you'll probably find them for free if you Google it. The plans to make this, it's really simple, just 18 mil plywood construction and screws. Um, a couple of springs and a couple of brackets, um, you're, or you can just buy the kit. So, I just want to thank Sandy Thompson because he actually gave this to me. Um, didn't cost me a penny this part. Unfortunately, um, Sandy probably fell into a similar trap because he gave me this bit, 
but then I realized there was a load of parts missing and we then had to go and spend a load of money on the parts. So let me dismantle it for you after you switch back to the other camera, Carol, and I'll show you the, the other parts. Um, whatever you think works. So let's take the springs off. Now the first thing that didn't come First thing that didn't come was these slats. These slats are made from spring steel and they're the thinnest ones you can get. These are actually ten thousandths of an inch thick, ten thou thick. Um, ten thou thick. You can get thicker ones but they're just not as good. So um, I, I did start with a thicker set of slats and I found that I did break a few. Um, and that's one other thing I want to mention about this machine is as you're about to discover it, it is quite complicated um, having the machine is not the be all and end all you also have to have all this other equipment to go along with it and um, and even then it can still go wrong I never broke a side when I used to bend all my sides by hand I never broke a side until I um, started using this side bender so there, is a, there was a bit of a learning curve for me and I found that um, bending by hand uh, is a little bit more forgiving and you can use actually slightly thicker wood. When you're using the side bender you have to make sure you're really thicknessed properly. That's um, between 2 mil and 2.2 mil. 2.15 mil is the exact thickness I aim for. That's 0.085 of an inch. Okay, so you need some slats. You can actually bend the sides without the slats, but the slats will certainly increase your chance of success. So put those on the list. Um, also, I'm not selling any of this stuff. So if you want to find it, you'll have to go to, um, um, I got mine from lmi.com. That's uh, Luthiers Mercantile International. Question. TV said, so you wouldn't, you wouldn't buy one, of, get one of these for just making one guitar? No, you certainly wouldn't want to splash out the cash to buy one of these machines just for one guitar. This is for your more serious builders, unfortunately. Right, so let's get to the, um, the expensive bit then. So this is your silicon heat blanket. And this is what our man bought from China. So uh, you get some great deals from China. I've seen them myself. Um, but when it comes to tools, um, I'm afraid that I always buy from um, a, a, a recognized supplier that I know. And then I know that I'm going to get the right kit. You know, I'm sure there's different qualities of heat blanket. So I would buy it from a guitar maker supplier to make sure you're getting the right, the right stuff. Invented by NASA to keep their satellites warm, probably. So you get different sizes and different lengths, obviously different ones for ukes and etc. This is my standard one for doing acoustic guitars. But the heat blanket is not the, the be all and end all. This is just the bit that gets hot. It doesn't know how hot to get without the controller. So let me introduce you to the controller. Get the close up on that one, yeah? Maybe I'll turn it on. So we can see the numbers. Right, the controller, I'll turn it on in a minute. The controller, this, this thing here, I can set the temperature, okay? But the, temp, the temperature, this doesn't know how hot your heat blanket is unless you have some kind of temperature sensor. So this is the key to it. I think this is the bit that was missing. So this is your temperature sensor. Um, if you just, uh, if I put the close-up lens on a sec, we'll get a close-up of that. It's literally just like um, a bimetallic strip or a two, two, two bits of metal. Two bits of metal joined at the end. It's like a wire. And that becomes a temperature sensor. So it plugs into the controller over here and then we can dial in the temperature. So this, this bit has to go in between the blanket and the wood to, um, 
to tell the controller what temperature has been reached. And this is the bit that I suspect was missing from your kit. So this is the first safety measure. Now, I happen to know personally, or I've met two guitar makers that have burnt their own workshops down, or their workshops have burnt down. Um, so I don't want any of you guys to do that. This is the first safety measure, but there's another one, right? So this is a mechanical timer. Now, there are reasons why a mechanical timer might be better than a digital one. Um, so, with the kit that I bought was supplied with a mechanical timer, so I don't know, whatever happens, the timer will still switch off. I guess, um, um, I guess if the power goes off, the, the blanket's going to go off anyway, so I don't really know. Um, why it should be a mechanical timer, to be honest. Any timer is better than no timer, okay? So this is a 15 minute mechanical timer. I can set it to 15 minutes, and then I know that whatever happens, it's gonna switch off after 15 minutes, and it won't be long enough to set fire to anything. Now, these blankets are incredible. They are absolutely astonishing how hot and how quick they get. So having two safety measures for me is, um, well, it's vital. And I won't use this unless I'm using both safety measures. Okay. So that's the health and safety lecture over. And I'm really sorry to hear about that, but there's probably a little socket on your thing where you plug the temperature controller, the sensor in, and you can buy these as a spare. Um, if you go to the forum, Darren has also suggested some other suppliers where you can buy this kind of stuff from. Okay, so brilliant. Uh, if we could have a wider shot then, Carol, then I'm going to um, actually start bending this side. Let's pop this back in the jig temporarily, and I'm going to show you how we prepare the sides, okay? So we don't just buy a side off the internet and then whack it in the jig. As you heard me say earlier, um, the thickness of the side is quite important. Okay, so that's the first thing. This side has been thicknessed to about 2.15 millimetres, between 2.1 and 2.2 millimetres. Um, that's 0.085 of an inch, roughly, 85 thousandths of an inch. And also, <clears throat> just gonna move the camera down a bit. I've also decided which way round they're gonna go. So if you look at these bits of wood, you can see they're book matched. Can you see how the pattern matches? That's called book matching. Obviously these pieces of wood started life like this and then somebody with a very big, powerful bandsaw cut it down the middle and it was opened like a book, right? Then it, they were thicknessed. So we've got a thicknessing machine, we put them through, which takes them down to the thickness that we were talking about. Um, can we have the other one back please, Carol? Because I wanna show you, we can choose which way around it goes. So this is the book match face. It matches better than that face. If you're not sure, you can just check. If you look at the end there, can you see that discolored patch? And then you can still see it on there, look. But it matches a bit better. So that's my best clue that this is the book match side. And I've marked it here, look. I've marked it, book match side. And I've also marked it with an arrow there. So this is the side that I'm gonna get glued down to the the um, soundboard and then I've also chosen I want to cut, cut off those discoloured parts so I've chosen this end as the end that's going to be um, joined for the tailpiece so I'll just show you what I mean so that's going to be my my tailpiece there going together and then my soundboard will be glued onto this face so you have to make all these decisions before you start Otherwise, you might end up with two left-handed sides. 
because they're bulk matched, you want them to be um, matching as they go round. Um, if you end up with two left hand sides, it doesn't really matter, it's not the end of the world. But some smart aleck like me might come along and notice. So there you go, I'm going to start with this one. We only do one at a time, so I'm going to start with, with this one and put the other one to one side. Um, while I'm just preparing this, we'll have a question, shall we? What's this appropriate now? So, do you, so um, can you recommend uh, woods to use? He, he's had a go with rosewood and it was good, but he tried mahogany and it seemed to splinter. So are some better than others? And are there any that you would say steer clear of altogether? Fantastic question. I'm glad the crew's here to ask all the important questions. Thanks again, Deej, for that. Um, yes. He's actually at work. <laughs> um, yeah, we won't mention that. We won't tell anybody. Yes, as, as you've noticed here, um, some of you might know this is rosewood. I've selected rosewood on purpose. And this is what I recommend as the wood of choice for your first build, because it is very... Um, it's the easiest to bend, it's very forgiving. Um, and so this is highly recommended. Mahogany can be a real pain or it can be easy, it depends on the piece. Um, yeah, every piece of wood is different. So the best I can recommend is just give it a try. If you're lucky enough to have some spare pieces, then you can give it a try and see how it goes. Um, if you're really having problems, especially with mahogany, then you could try making your wood a little bit thinner. Um, but if you go down below two millimetres, then you could be in trouble. So definitely thicker than two millimetres. But you might have a bit more luck if you're struggling, just taking your wood just a little bit thinner. And that's something that we do, um, if we'd make it a cutaway guitar, I would mark which area of the side is going to be for the cutaway, and I would make that just a little bit thinner to make it easier to bend for the tighter bends. Okay. Any, any to steer clear of, you said? Right? Any to steer clear of. For the beginner, anything highly figured, I would steer clear of. Um, honestly, for a beginner, go for rosewood because it is by far the most forgiving. Um, if you don't like rosewood, then, you know, you use whatever you want, but just bear in mind that you know, your choices can make your life easier or harder and you might end up hating yourself. Just saying, been there. <laughs> right, can we go back to the other camera, please, Carol? The camera. Um, no, the other one, please. Three? Two. Right, so I'm paying close attention to where my arrow is. And I'm going to wrap them. And put that down upside down. First in paper and then in foil. So I'm, I'm keeping an eye on the arrow so I don't lose my position. Uh, see that on cam four. There's my arrow, that's all right. And now I'm just gonna, I'm gonna wet that. Of course I forgot to get the water ready, didn't I? I didn't get any water. Rock and roll, uh, I've never used ebony for a side, no, um, rock and roller, seeing as how you ask, I've never used ebony for sides, I have used ebony for binding, and I've got to say that is one of the times where I, I did hate myself for that. Um, I used ebony for the binding on one of my guitars, and... Uh, yeah, I actually snapped it as I was bending it by hand. And then, uh, you know, you just carry on, don't you? So I was carrying on and snapped again. Carried a bit more, because you can just glue it back together, carry on. Yeah, but after the third break, I ended up jumping up and down on it, throwing it into the corner of the room. It does happen. Yeah, if you have a proper paddy, best thing to do is to throw it away the offending item, get rid of it, start again. Um, what I decided in the end actually was that by the time I'd finished the guitar, 
you couldn't even tell it was ebony because it just looks black. So I might as well have just used black plastic. So there are very, very few parts of the guitar that I would, I would use plastic. Um, um, if you wanted black binding, then I would say just use plastic. It's so much easier. You can just bend it with a hairdryer. So much easier. Um, I was going to say one more thing about ebony, but I forgot. Um, well, Mike Abbott uh, was just asking, how was the zero coating to bend? I know you've zero coating, not too bad. Zero coat is very similar to rosewood. So um, okay. not a problem. Not a problem, zero coating. Of course, your mileage may vary. Look what's arrived. Oh, the water's arrived. Thank you for that, Carol. Amazing. Right, I usually do this with a scusher as well, but I can't find that either. Here we go. I like to use this scusha. Now I, I used to um, I used to um, soak my sides for 20 minutes in a bath of water. But what you find, um, that's okay with rosewood, but with some of the more highly figured wood, um, the grain can start to separate and it can actually cause you more problems. So I don't soak my sides anymore. All I do is a spritz with my spritzer that's not working. I'll try a different one. Always have a backup. Preparation's everything, isn't it? You could just rag it on, but I just want to show off, don't I? I want to show off of my scooter. Here we go. So it doesn't need to be completely soaking wet. Just needs to be nice and damp. Look at that. And then I'll fold the paper over. Wet that. And then let's wet the other side as well. Doesn't need to be soaking wet. Just dampened off. You can experiment yourselves with different amounts of water, but um, with these side bending jigs, it's relatively easy. You don't need to worry too much. As long as it's nice and damp. Did I have a blade? Let's just rip in, I'll just rip that. It's ripped off nice. And then we'll fold it in the um, foil. So the foil traps the moisture. Foil will help trap the moisture. Now, I need to just check which end is my arrow. Check twice, cut once. So there's my arrow, folks. There's my arrow. That's my back. So that's going to go um, over here. Here. So this is the tail end, right? So let's line it up ready to go there like that. Now plug the blanket in. So the blanket just plugs in there. You want the camera three, four for this, I think. So um, blanket plugs in there. Nothing will happen until we set the timer. <clears throat> I'm going to put this um, the thermostat temperature sensor in um, underneath the blanket. So the blanket's going to go on top of the wood. 
and the sensor goes in between the blanket and the wood. I'm going to get a close up of that in a minute. I can't actually find a camera so I can see it. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, that's it. Yeah. Let me adjust this camera as well. And you'll get a better shot. Okay, so we're almost ready to go. Let's switch it on and see if it works. Now I'm going to set the temperature at about 320. What is going on there? 320 or 330 around there. Let's go 330. Get some steam going. The temperature isn't um, completely vital. You just need to be creating a lot of steam. Um, it's the steam that does the bending. So whatever method of bending you're using, it's always the steam that's doing the bending. In this case, so what I'm going to do is just feed my bit of wood in, making sure I've got my it the right way around. I can just feed my bit of wood in, keep it nice and straight and keep an eye on the temperature chance of falling out. I'm just going to wind that down until it holds my piece of wood. And then I can put my temperature sensor back in on top of the wood, between the blanket and the wood there. Can you see that? Let's get a close up. Hang on. There we go. So this blanket's already getting hot. And you've got, um, is that degrees C or degrees F? We're in um, Fahrenheit over there. We're in Fahrenheit. So you can see it's reading 94, target 330. So you said Fahrenheit, did you? This is in Fahrenheit, yes. Just think Fahrenheit 4, what is it? Fahrenheit 451. What is it? That's the Fahrenheit 4. Five, whatever it is. As long as you don't go above that, it won't catch fire. <laughs> That's the theory anyway. Right, so we need to double check the length over there if we get this camera, Carol. Two. Camera two. Watch this. I'm pulling my, um, my slat down and I'm lining it up to make sure I've got the right length. And I can line that up with the end of my bit of wood. That's to make sure that the end of my bit, bit of wood will end at the right place here. I'll show you a couple of these different moulds in a minute when I've done this. We'll do a little bit of question and answers and I'm going to show you also how you would do it by hand. So as you see you don't need to rush or panic or anything. That's just all clamped in place, getting nice and hot. We'll let it get up to temperature and what I can do is get these, get these ready. So I can put these in place, start to get them ready. One other thing I like to do is you can put some clips on to clip it all together. What are these called? Bulldog clips. So these kind of metal bulldog clips. Now you can see steam coming out, look. That's definitely steam and not smoke. <laughs> um, clipping it like that with the bulldog clips. Did you get them out of the office? I've had these for years, Kane. They're not yours, don't panic. That just holds everything together for you and it does help. Wow, look at that for an angle. And you might want to wear um, gloves for this. Uh, I've got asbestos guitar maker's fingers, so I feel no pain. But you guys 
you might want to get some good thick leather gloves or something. So you can see there's plenty of smoke, uh, steam coming out. Um, there, it's actually, did you notice it jumped? Because the sensor wasn't in contact. So it's actually getting up to temperature. Let's just move the sensor and make sure. If we put it under a clip, and we'll get a better actual reading of it. There's one thing you have to be careful about with these sensors, is that it's actually in the right place, sensing the, the wood. Um, it doesn't even have to reach full temperature. Oh, I can see there's plenty of steam coming out. So I'm just gonna go ahead and start doing it. Let's go, what I wanna show you is, I'm. I'm, um, I'm going to do the first bend. So can you see in there? Maybe I'll get some more light on it. There we go. Yeah. So I'm going to wind this down now. You can have an overhead shot as well and go between. Wind this down, but I'm not going to go all the way down. I'm going to leave just a little gap there, about an eighth of an inch. Okay. can't see it. So in there, I haven't wound it all the way down. I've left a little gap of an eighth of an inch. So now we do the other bends. So this is just simply a case of um, pulling this down, maybe get the overhead cam for this, Carol. So I'm just going to pull this down. That's it, and then the same on the other side. Take these off, pull it down. And you can see it just holds it against the machine like that, dead easy. And now I'm just going to wind that last little bit down. We go to cam four, uh, yeah. The last little bit in there, just to snug it down. And that's it. So we've still got. Um, We've still got five minutes left on the timer, four minutes left on the timer. So you can just leave it cooking or you can switch it off. I'm going to switch it off. Yeah, the sensors fell out, look. So if can get, that's one thing you've got to really keep an eye on these blooming sensors because that will fall out and you'll end up over temperature. So apart from me sensor falling out, that's how you do it. Now, as you can see, that is a whole lot of expense and um, messing about just to bend one side. Um, having said that, it's reliable. As once you've worked out how to use it, it's fairly reliable and you can bend um, highly figured wood with it without too many problems. And so it's a great investment if you're going to be making more than one guitar. If you're going to be making lots of guitars, then you certainly want something like this to make your life easier. Um, and what I'm going to do is just put that out of the way. and show you what they look like when they come out. So I would leave that now for at least 20 minutes, um, but preferably overnight I would leave it till it's proper cooled down and then take it out. And uh, there is always a certain amount of what they call spring back. So I would usually touch it up before I assemble the guitar. I would just touch it up with my um, heat bender by hand anyway. So even though I've got one of these, I always do everything, go over everything by hand just before I assemble it. So one thing you want to be aware of is that it, it will probably spring back and relax a little bit. Um, might well need touching up after the event. Um, so yes, that is what I call the Fox side bender. And that is the, the bit that um, our friend 
was missing off the internet was that. So when I bought this gear, I actually bought a spare sensor, temperature sensor, because if that breaks for the sake of a pound or two, um, or however much it costs, if that breaks, the whole system um, is in danger of burning your workshop down. So let's try and avoid that, folks. So yeah, I wanted to do that, just hopefully prevent anybody else making the same mistake. You know, you think you're getting a bargain from a Chinese website, and maybe you did get a bargain. Um, you know, the heat blanket was probably fine, but you did, didn't have enough control, unfortunately. Can uh, log in here? Yep. Um, if people look in the comments, uh, Bag Press has suggested... I, said, uh, I did say that already. Uh, yep. Uh, I said that earlier on, but yeah, I'll say it again. Um, if you do find that comment, you'll see on the forum, Darren did suggest some um, UK suppliers of all this kind of gear as well. All right. So I get mine from Luthiers Mercantile International, um, the guitar maker suppliers. Um, but yeah, you can get them from the UK as well. Brilliant. So that is the side bending machine. Now I'm going to show you uh, a few sort of cheaper methods doing it more by hand. So this here, little baby, is my side bender that I use. Um, my trusty side bender, I've had it for over 20 years, still going, serves me well. Again though, they are, they're not cheap. If you're only making one guitar, it's a hell of an expense to splash out. Um, so we are going to offer, in fact, we already do if you ask, if you buy the, the acoustic kit from us and um, go to the site, you, you'll see the acoustic kit that we sell. Um, if you ask, I'll bend the sides for you. If that's one of the things is the major issue um, of building a guitar is obviously bending the sides. So you can have the sides pre-bent, we'll do that for you. Um, but there is one final um, nuclear option, which I'll come to in a minute. Um, but that is kind of like the industry standard um, hand iron, uh, side bending iron. So um, I usually just stick it on full power and go for it. That's our timer gone off. Um, so you can make one of these by hand. So um, I actually cover all this on the course, by the way. Um, there is um, there's a whole section on side bending where we go into, into all this in detail. But you can make your own with a bit of pipe and a blowtorch down the end of it. Just need a hot pipe. The trouble with this kind of thing, this Heath Robinson kind of thing, is that it's just control, really. Like, um, you know, with this kind of gear, you've got ultimate control. The guitar makers tend to be control freaks. Am I right? Yes, I am. So that is your um, sort of cheap option. I started with something very similar to this, just a, a hot pipe. So um, I'll tell you the nuclear option in just one second, but Carol's got a hand up with a question. No, it's, no, it's just that um, you and Black and Brad Press were saying that the, the, the sensor is called a K-type thermocouple. Thermocouple. And, I knew it'd have a fancy name. And the spare, they're cheap as chips, apparently. They're spares and RS yep. and various people, they, they do different temperature ranges. Yep, cheap as chips, and it could have saved you the expense of a new heat blanket. Because I don't think I answered your very first question, which is... Can I still use this blanket? And I think we all know the answer to that one. If you've got a heat blanket that's got the texture of secondhand chewing gum, I think you should bin it before you electrocute yourself. So yeah, they're pretty tough things, solid tough things, but I guess they only take so much punishment and they will burn themselves to death if you don't um, have some kind of controller for them. So the nuclear option for bending sides for you guys who've stayed till the end. Um, this guitar over here was made without a heat bender at all because we used, um, we used a technique of laminating the sides. So this is five layers of um, veneer bent around a mold and it's done inside a vacuum bag. 
So um, we're very lucky and honoured to have Darren King, the UK bagpress.com guru. Um, and he's, um, he actually came to the workshop and completely free of charge, we made a, um, a masterclass on how to use the bag press for making acoustic guitars, including making the sides. And we did quite a lot of other things as well. Um, gluing the bridge on was one, um, gluing braces on, um, all kinds of ideas and other stuff for using a bag press to make acoustic guitars, um, not least of which was um, bending the sides. So yeah, you can, you can um, use a mould as a form when, you, um, when you're working with veneers they're a lot thinner and a lot more flexible and so they just bend a lot easier and you haven't got to use any heat at all you can just bend them over the mould glue in between put it in a vacuum bag and come back the next day you've got a beautifully formed set of sides main advantage being there is no spring back with a laminated side so um, yeah major advantage uh, so if you're interested in laminated sides, then check out, there's a play, whole playlist on the site, on the Guitar Making channel. There's a whole playlist where Darren takes us through the process. Um, so once again, thanks for that, Darren. That was way above and beyond the call of duty and much appreciated. Um, helped us out a lot and we enjoyed it. So absolutely fantastic. And do we have any... Whoa, do we have any final questions, Carol, before the workshop falls down? Uh, no, not at the moment, no. Um, no. Nice bit of all day. Okay, guys, so hopefully you found something enjoyable or useful in that video. Um, please like it, share it. If you're not already subscribed, make sure you do that because you don't want to miss stuff coming up. Um, we broadcast at the moment at 1 p.m. every Wednesday and Saturday. Coming up on Saturday, I'm going to be carving this Roland's guitar. So this is an electric guitar that I'm making for Roland. And um, due to popular request, I've been asked, can you show me how to do a, a PRS style carved top? So um, this is what I would call a double cut style guitar. And I'm going to be show you, showing you on Saturday, one o'clock, how we carve um, one of these. So at the moment it looks pretty chunky and square. On Saturday we're going to turn it into a voluptuous curvy shape. And then we can run our fingers all over it and nobody can stop us. Right, so before I get carried away... Um, I'm going to wrap this up, but first of all, I just want to say congratulations, Marcel. Marcel retired last week, so he's hung up his overalls at work, whatever it is, <laughs> and he's putting on his new guitar making overalls, and he's going to be spending more time in the workshop, hopefully, building guitars. So uh, hopefully see you on the forum and on the site, Marcel. Um, thanks for watching. Dutch contingent! Dutch contingent! Yeah, and thanks to everybody else for watching as well. So remember, what's important is check twice, cut once, and don't let your sensor fall out. Oh.